Welcome back to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. The conversation that we're going to have is with Dana Glazer. Now, Dana has been shooting movies since he was about nine years old and has recently released a movie called A Case of Blue, which is a fantastic movie. Very smart, hard to outguess where the movie's going. So if you love a movie that has all sorts of different reveals to it and is something that's very smart and entertaining, A Case of Blue is a movie that you're going to want to order and watch several times. Now, with Dana, we get into talking about his grandfather. We talk about his kids and nurturing creativity in general. We talk about movies and acting. We talk about, of course, his movie, Case of Blue. And then we end up with a really awesome story about his grandfather helping him out when he was a young college student. What I want you guys to do is... After you've listened to this, I want you guys to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't done so already, and then I want you to share it with a friend who would be interested in hearing about Dana's story and about grandfathers and the influence of grandfathers. So do those couple of things and join myself and Dana in an awesome conversation. Hello and welcome to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. This is your host, Greg Payne, coming at you from Studio 12. This podcast is about being the best possible grandpa you can be, focusing on what it is to be a grandpa and how we can all share that experience together for our grandchildren. Hi, Dana. Thank you for taking time out of your day to sit down with us and have a great conversation on the Cool Grandpa Podcast. I really do appreciate you being here with us. It's so great to be here, Greg. Thank you for having me. Now, one thing I like to do when we're having these conversations is get to know your grandfathers a little bit. Tell us their names. Give us the backgrounds, details so that we can help to get to know them as individuals. Absolutely. And I had a, I was really blessed to have a wonderful relationship with both of my grandparents growing up. And uh, just starting to talk, talking first about my, my mother's father, uh, his name was Hai Sahagi, and he was uh, he was born in 1905. He passed away in 1999, just short of my wedding, unfortunately. Mm. Uh, and actually, it was 98. And he was uh, he his family came from Armenia, uh, and so when my grandfather was growing up, he was really brought up by his aunt. Uh, who, when he was later on, he would refer to his aunt as his mother, but really he was talking about his auntie. Uh, And he spoke Armenian, because that's, you know, how he was brought up. Uh, And the kids really picked on him. And so he he had to really figure it out for himself. And so when I was a, a kid, my grandfather would always say to me, you know, if I only if only I had somebody to talk to. That's what I remember thinking to myself as a kid. And you're so lucky, Dana, because I'm here to talk with you and to tell you, you know, into any, any questions you have or anything, I can, I can be of help to you. And he really was. And he, he taught me how to play tennis. He taught me how to change a, a, a tire on a car. He, he was just a, a very uh, powerful force in my life. He actually, uh, it was because of my grandfather, uh, this grandfather that I became a movie maker. Uh, he had a Super 8 movie camera. And when I was nine years old, uh, I was really interested in, I saw something on television that was like an animation. And I said to my grandfather, well, can we, you know, I'd like to make an, a movie, an animated movie. Uh, I've, I've since, of course, graduated to uh, to live action. I have no patience for animation. That's now for my middle child son, who's very into <laughs> that. But, uh, but in any case, uh, my grandfather said to me, "Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to to be your cameraman, and and uh, and I'll pay for the the clay and the sets and stuff, and the film, and you come up with the story and the characters." And so I would spend each summer for like nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Each summer I would spend an inordinate amount of time in my basement working with these with these little clay figures and building like a, a set. And so the first set was uh, of cops and robbers. And the next one was called aliens attack. And the next one was about a dragon and a knight. And you know, my grandfather had really no idea how to do animation, but 
it was really a special thing for us to be spending, you know, every every summer we would we would spend a whole day you know, working through this, trying to figure out how to make these little animated movies. And at the end of each film, my grandfather would, would, would then say, go stand behind the set. And I'd be like, why? He said, just stand behind the set. And I'd be like, okay. And he'd start filming me. And I would, and so there's like all this footage of me waving my hands going, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> this is not professional. And, and so, <laughs> but you know, it's of course very precious now. And, and the movies were called a Dane Gramp production. Okay. Uh, and I, I maintain my production company. That's the name of my production company to this day. Oh, very cool. During this time, I mean, it's, it's been over multiple years. Did you, how did you figure out the storyboarding or, or did you, was it, was it just a complete case of, I've got some figures. Now I got to figure out how to make them move and how do I want the story to go? And so making it up as you go and going through that discovery process. Well, that's you, you're asking me to re- reflect on my nine-year-old uh, <laughs> uh, abilities as a filmmaker. And, and, you know, truth be told, I really didn't quite understand that. I think what we did, I remember lying on my couch next to my grandfather and, and dictating to him how the story should go. Uh, but there was, you know, in terms of shots and such, I sort of let that, be his thing okay okay <laughs> which he really didn't my grandfather was uh particularly famous for never wanting to shoot a, a picture of anybody unless we could see their feet as well so there were all these wide shots of everything there was never and my grandfather was not one for close-ups okay <laughs> so, so there there are all these you know these uh wide shots of master shots if you will of of the action uh it wasn't until uh, I was in my teenage years that I uh, started understanding what that meant in terms of storyboarding and learning about Alfred Hitchcock. And uh, there was a book in the library where I, the school I attended, uh, and it was uh, a making of Raiders of the Lost Ark. And so I remember going through and saying, oh, and Steven Spielberg drew these little sketch drawings, and that's how it turned into a storyboard. And so I actually, uh, became quite proficient at drawing lots of storyboards and conceptualizing in that sort of way. And, and you know, and I think that storyboarding is an incredibly important uh, tool, not just for pre-visualizing what you're doing, but also in terms of uh, clarifying to your, your crew and your cast what the shot is and, and you know, where, where the camera is going to be. And, and that saves a lot of time. And when you're talking about shooting a film like A Case of Blue, which we shot in 18 days, it had to be incredibly well planned out. And so storyboards uh, was, you know, an important pa- part of that process. Yeah. So I, I love storyboards. And it's funny because I sort of think about my son, who's currently up in his room right now editing. Uh, he does. He's he's a, a YouTuber and okay. he, he has like 1600 subscribers and he's putting out these these little videos that are I'm trying to remember what the games are that that he he has like he plays off of the mythology of these video of these game online games that he plays and he doesn't do any storyboards whatsoever and his his shot choices and the way that everything flows is really quite something and he doesn't do any storyboarding whatsoever it's just very intuitive for him which is really great so it's it's an interesting thing that way the way I don't know if I'm using the words correctly, but the democratization of the technology, whether it's like with this podcasting or with movie making on your phone or however it is, it's just letting people dive in with that creativity and just produce and make what you make and figure it out as you go. You know, you don't necessarily have to uh, go through all the rigors. Now there's ups and downs with all of that. But just letting people, and especially uh, boys and, and girls that are going through that exploration and, and growth period, just let them be creative. You know, we, oh, yeah. we lose so much of that as we get older. It's Oh, completely. You know, completely. it's anything oh, they yes, can to, to, to be creative, do it. You know, well, I think in. that, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, that there's certain parts of the brain that work that you, you it, it was interesting with my daughter. My daughter wrote a book. That, that she, you know, basically dictated to me last year 
from top to bottom. It's a children's book. And then we got my my niece to do the drawings and we my wife did the layout and we put the we put the the book out. And it's really special for my daughter who did this. Uh, and she didn't like we, it was, we didn't take it apart initially. It wasn't like, OK, who are the characters? And it was just like, OK, tell me a story. And she just went and just started going with it and just her imagination, you know, wherever it went. And it was really uh, special that way. Whereas in her school, they're like, OK, we're going to teach creative writing. and We're going to first talk about, you know, we're going to break it up into little pieces. Right. And and while I think that that can be useful in some ways, it it's a ta- it's tapping into the wrong side of the brain. It's it's better to um, to have to explore in a in a you know in a way that you're not so co- so aware of the mechanisms, but just sort of being in the moment of the creation of it. And so, you know, that's that's something I always try to encourage my students when, when I when I teach uh, screenwriting is that you go and you you just start with page one and just go all the way through to the end. And if you change your mind about something, then just keep going as if you had changed, made that change beforehand. But, you know, keep that flow going all the way to the end as much as possible. And don't, and I've, I've seen people try to perfect the first 30 pages and never get beyond that. So sure. it's a, it's a creative process. It's a, it's a, a tricky, tricky thing. Well, and, you know, I just think about how lucky you were that you had this grandfather that was letting you go with it, that, that every summer, okay, we've, we've got a movie production coming up, you know, Dana, Dana's coming over and and we've got movies to shoot and, and things to create together. And yeah, it was special. It was very, very special. You know, I, I was very blessed to have him in my life and he was, he was alive until I was, I think, 28. So it was, you know, very, uh, it was a, a wonderful relationship. And, you know, and as I got older, we would talk about different things and it was really exciting. You know, I remember talking to him about girls and, you know, and he would tell me about his experiences. And one of the things that I did with, uh, with all of my grandparents, uh, my, I didn't, I never got to meet my, my grandmother on my father's side, because unfortunately she passed away before I was born. But what I did was I, uh, for my, my, uh, my grandparents that were with me, uh, I interviewed them uh, on videotape uh, and I had them tell all of their stories that they had told me in their life. Uh, and and so I have that and they're all unfortunately, you know, long past, but I, I do have these videos so that their stories live on. And I think that's a really important part of, of you know, uh, valuing and honoring, you know, their spirits and, and being able to share it with my own children. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, it, that strikes a nerve with me in the sense that I interviewed uh, three sisters that um, have a grandfather that they never met. Their grandfather had been born in 1889 mm-hmm. and uh, passed away uh, before the end of World War II in 1945. And so they grew up with this big little bit of a gap of Mm. never knowing him. They knew him through now. He, he was a a general in the Marine Corps. And so there was a lot of diaries, memorabilia and some things like that, but there was this gap that they had. And the only reference or the only voice that they have was this interview that he did uh, for CBS radio. in I think 1944 when he was on a rotation back to the States and it's an isolated, like four or five minute, you know, section of radio that, that survived, mm-hmm. but that's the only thing they have that's as far as, have. as, as far as a voice goes. And as far as, you know, any kind of moving pictures are, are super rare. So having this just will allow even your grandchildren to know their great grandparents, right? And their yeah. great, great grandparents even. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There's, there's a, a, there's just a lot of value, I think, in terms of, you know, we, I, I think that uh, our culture really de-emphasizes the value of of our elders, of our of grandparents. You know, we sort of treat them like, oh, they're just, you know, we'll put them in the old age homes or the retirement centers or what have you. And I think that it's, you know, they people who have been around and seen, been around the block so many times, have a lot to contribute and a lot of perspective that that has, you know, has a great intrinsic value. And, and I think that it's important that, that we honor that as much as possible. 
Yeah. Well, and I think the other part too, is that people talk about as well as when they're trying to, and this happens when you're at a certain age, whatever that age is where it hits you, where it's like, I want to know where my ancestors came from. Where did these traits come from? How, how was this journey? You know, and it, we're far enough now, we're almost a hundred years at this point of, you know, people that had family lore and family, um, that came out of like Oklahoma that came mm-hmm. out of the dust bowls, right. That, yeah. that migrated to California. And yeah. so there's these parts of these family, uh, movements and you just don't understand it. And there's, there's, there can be gaps unless you really do a little bit of looking backwards, but then also being able to appreciate what yeah. your, your grandfather went through. I mean, growing yeah. up speaking Albanian and where everybody else was speaking English probably. And I think you had mentioned that he had talked about where he had grown up not being able to talk to anybody. Oh, Ar- Armenian. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was, uh, you know, it's really ch- uh, challenging for him. I'll tell you one, one thing when you were just saying that about, uh, about the history, uh, one thing that was, that was really interesting about my grandparents is that uh, have you ever heard of the coconut grove fire? No, I've heard of the Coconut Grove um, nightclub, right? The Coconut was... Grove nightclub in Boston. Okay. All right. And, if, and it's interesting. I grew up with, I remember there was a, uh, a book that I had that had like the great disasters of the world, like Titanic and, you know, like, and, 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 and you yeah. know, so uh, the Coconut Grove fire in 1942, basically what, what happened was uh, it was an, a swanky nightclub in Boston uh, and there were these uh, palm trees which were flammable, and somebody lit, uh, was trying to change a light bulb, and they lit a match to see what they were doing better, and and it caught fire with the with the foliage, uh, and the smoke just went through the room like crazy, and they did not have uh, any just doors that opened and closed; they only had revolving doors. Ooh. And so people panicked and then they tried to get to the doors and then they it jammed the doors. And nobody could get out. So it was like a horrific thing that happened. My grandparents were scheduled to go that evening to that nightclub for an engagement party for a couple that were their closest friends. And they're and like they were part of like this group of friends. Everybody was going. And my grandfather uh, my grandmother had her hair done and was ready to go. My grandfather said, you know, I just don't feel like going tonight. And my grandmother was like, what are you talking about? This is right. so important. And she was so mad at him. And he's like, no, I just, it just, I just don't feel like going tonight. Now, I don't know. It's possible that he had a stomach ache or something too. I don't, you know, it's possible, sure. but he did not want to go. And, and so they stayed home and, their friends called them at around 10 o'clock at night and said, where are you? We're having a great time. And 15 minutes later, they were all dead. Wow. Horrible. And, and uh, at like one o'clock in the morning, the babysitters for the kid, the children, who, you know, from the other, the other families were, the other uh, couples were calling my grandparents saying, where is everybody? What's happening? You know, there wasn't any television then. And my grandfather had to go in the middle of the night and identify his friends. But, you know, I, I think about this story quite often uh, because if my grandparents had decided to go, yeah. uh, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's really like, well, powerful, you know, moment. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the history is, um, is it, it's, it impacts everything. Absolutely. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit, but before I do... Can we get your son's YouTube channel and your daughter's book and go ahead and talk about, you know, just get, give those titles and then let's get those links into the show <laughs> notes and let's see if we can get a few more subscribers and maybe uh, another <laughs> sure. book or two sold, you know? Sure. Well, and uh, uh, so uh, Jamie, uh, his, his uh, uh, YouTube channel is called Black Hole Producers. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'm not even sure where he got this from, but black hole producers. Uh, and, uh, and he has quite a few uh, videos on there. Uh, my daughter, Georgia, 
Uh, her book is called, oh God, I'm losing my mind. What is her name in the book? Uh, no Pizza, No Cake. No Pizza, No Cake. No Pizza, No Cake. And I can share, uh, I'll share with you a link to the book. Uh, oh. But it's, it's, it's uh, about a little girl who goes to these birthday parties and she doesn't like pizza and she doesn't like cake. <laughs> oh, no. And so she gets very frustrated and and she decides to do something about this. So she talks to the mayor and the mayor says, there's nothing I can do. And she 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 eventually gets together a whole bunch of other people who don't like pizza and don't like cake. And they march on Washington <laughs> <laughs> to get the, the president <laughs> to, to pass an executive order. <laughs> oh, very cool. <laughs> So now do, do, does she win at the end? Do, does she get her executive order? Oh, you'll have to see. Okay. Okay. Good. We don't, we don't want to spoil it. No, for, no. For everybody. We, okay. So <laughs> but it's a, it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very sweet book. And it, and it was, you know, it was, we, we were working on this. Uh, basically my daughter was dictating to me. I'm typing. She's, she, you know, was just telling me the whole story uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, we we're working on this. And it was just, it was a really special gra- and very gratifying thing to be doing this with her. So it's a special thing to have kids who are, are creative. And I have an, a, 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 third, a third son who's, who's uh, 17 uh, and who has uh, creativity as well. And in, 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 but more in the computer uh, uh, hardware department. Gotcha. So we, we got all sorts of different people here. Very cool. And creativity takes on all forms, shapes, and sizes. So yeah. you, you've got auto mechanics that I know that are super creative on how, how to get stuff going and then movie makers and filmmakers as well. So yeah. now let's go ahead and transition into talking a little bit about a case of blue. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit or, or have you give us a background what was the inspiration for this? And then let's give a little bit of a summary about the, the movie. Sure, sure. So in 2003, this is before I had children, uh, just before uh, I decided, you know, I'm going to go and uh, try drawing at a, at a life drawing class in New York City. There's a place called the Student Arts League. Uh, and so my wife and I were living in Hoboken. So I hopped on a bus and signed up for a class. And, and, uh, and when I went there, the woman who was the life drawing model was this, was, had a, a very strong resemblance to a, a woman who I had had a romance with when I was in my earlier twenties. Uh, and that was like a little bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it, it wasn't her, but it was it was just enough to make my imagination go. And sure. so I, I wrote this up as a, a short story and I wrote I wrote it. I, I wrote about how I got about halfway through the short story. And then I was like, I have absolutely no idea where this is going. And and so I put it away and I, I have I have tons of notebooks and folders and things where I, you know, of, of, you know, it's like an, it's like a, it's like a car shop where you have, you know, body parts and, you know, you know a tire over here and a an fender over here. And, and, and so I, I put it away, didn't think about it. Uh, and then 14 years later, I was at a uh, family wedding in the Boston area. That's originally where I'm from. Uh, and, and my parents were there and my mother and I had this whole heart to heart conversation. My mother was talking to me about downsizing and selling my childhood home and, and, you know, retirement and all these things. And, you know, and, and it was uh, a pretty heavy conversation. And as I was sort of processing this whole thing and driving back to Ridgewood, which is where I'm, uh, I live now uh, in New Jersey, uh, this story that I had put away so long ago, suddenly reawoke. And so, and by the time I got back to Ridgewood, I had the whole story in my head. And so, and then I spent the next 
month or so uh, writing it out. And then uh, uh, literally a year later, we were in production shooting it. Wow. And a year later from there, we were fin- I was done with the movie. And, you know, and that's pretty fast. I mean, once you once you get it set to go through getting the production set up and filming and everything, that's that's pretty quick, right? Yes. It's it's funny, right? Because so the that was in 2017 when I came up with with like when I wrote the script, right? 2018 was when I shot the film. Finished this, you know, then it was a, a process of editing. Uh, which, which when I was, when everything was said and done, all the color correction and the sound and everything uh, was 2000, summer of 2019. And then uh, it was a process of waiting for the, to, for the film festivals and, and positioning that correctly. And then of course the pandemic hit. And so now here we are in 2021. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's, it's like, wow, four years, you know? And I thought I was like, I was moving like a rocket ship because you're right. I mean, oftentimes with these things, it can take years. I mean, you watch these movies and you're like, oh, that was nice. And it's like, well, that took tell me 10 years of their life to get off, you know, off the ground. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and uh what I just what I decided when I when I wrote this script, it was a very it came from a very deep and personal place. Um and even though you know it's it's not me in the movie, it's it's sort of projection of my feelings about a lot of things, uh, and as it relates to my father, as it relates to age, as it relates to you know nostalgia, yeah. And so, it, you know, I I did I wanted it just to be very just to to shoot in a very small personal way with people I care about, uh, and to shoot it locally and. Uh, and not get too caught up in the, I have to find a big movie star and make them this big thing. And that can take years. Right. When you're you're trying to get like the big name actor. And I've done that song and dance previously. And I just, I I don't want to do this. I want to go and shoot a movie. So, you know, we got wonderful, wonderful actors that, that were new New York based you know, and didn't spend a lot of time with all that offers and stuff. We did a, a little bit of that, but not, but I was like determined that we are going to be shooting this movie in the summer of 2018. I was like, that's when we're shooting it, you know, and not like, okay, we'll just wait until, you know. Right. Somebody's schedule frees up or. That's right. Or, I was just like, I don't want to do that. And, and, you know, there's, there's, um, there are pluses and minuses to that. Because if you have a, a, an actor that's really recognizable, that really, you know, in terms of the sales, that can help the, that process. So there is there is that that side of it. But I, I don't think that I could have gotten a better uh, performer to play the main character than I did. I mean, I, you know, he was just wonderful to work with and just really epitomized the part. No, I thought I thought the the person that you have uh, playing Richard just to me, just nailed the part. I mean, and, and this is also what the writing that you, you did for it, because I'm, I'm watching it as a young grandfather and the story involves Richard, who's older than I am, but is going through that retirement. Um, and there's a lot of, okay, we're at this age now of trying to figure out who we are. He had put off some passions and some interests to do the responsible thing, raise a family, get a job, provide well, um, these types of activities. And then when you come to, okay, my, my work life is done. I, I need to transition. I think people sometimes don't realize how much transition goes on in older men's lives you know, going through the empty nester thing, then kids going through college, then kids getting married, you know, work and career end up wherever they end up. And you've got health and you've got so many things. And I loved how you were combining some of this and some of the angst and some of the anxiety that goes along with it, because I don't think that's something that's explored very often. Well, I think that you know, in, in our culture, uh, masculinity is is defined as you know being tough, and so I, I think that a lot of men are sort of you know keep it all inside, and and certainly that was an element of the film. 
as as Richard, you know, learning to uh, open, be more connected to his feelings. Uh, that's a big part of this. Uh, and and it was an interesting uh, experience trying to find the right actor to play Richard. Uh, it's it's played by a guy named Steven Schnetzer, who I don't know if, if your audience has ever watched soap operas, but he's actually he was a uh, there's a he was a very big name for a uh, soap opera called Another World. So if anybody watching that show, they'll be like, oh yeah, Richard Steven Schnetzer, of course. And the thing with Steven Schnetzer is that he he is amorphous in terms of his age. Like he, you know, and what I, what I, what I didn't want was to have somebody too young. Cause then it would seem like, why are you retiring, dude? Right. And right. I didn't want to have somebody who was like too old. Cause then it's like, well, oh, that's a little weird. Cause you're like, you know, hanging out with this, this 20 something girl. And there's something, you know, he had to have a, a degree of virility to him. And, uh, and Steven Schnetzer really, I think encompassed this well. And I, and that you know, I, I think that he he really and and it was amazing working with him as a performer because uh, as much as the film was scripted and there was storyboarded, there was also a lot of opportunity and room for play and and Stephen is of the, the the kind of caliber of an actor who's so in the moment of being that part of being that character as as we're shooting it that it's every take seemed like it was happening for the first time. And if there was anything that happened that was unexpected, he'd be responding to it in character. And it was really quite an extraordinary thing to sort of just see him it just encompass this role. And as a, as an, a person, he's really not the character. <laughs> yeah yeah so it's really he's really really is acting <laughs> wow. he's not like playing himself it's interesting that's very cool and i i like it too when people are playing against their normal their their character right there's there's some actors where it's it's this person and they're the same person in every single role and sometimes right. you absolutely love it and then there's other times and you get performances where somebody is going against what you're expecting and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and they have a chance and that's gotta be something too, for the actors, I would imagine that they like to play something that they're not. I mean, that's part of acting, right? Is yeah. make believe. Well, that's, and, it's make believe. It's, it's also, it's, it's all about empathy, you know, and, and, and finding, finding humanity in, in, characters and then exploring what is it how does that feel what's it feel like to try on try on this this mask and how you know and and how does that feel so yeah it's a it's a um it can be a really special thing it can be a really special thing and i think that more often than not people sort of go oh yeah they're just persons just acting that you know it's just like no they're just being themselves and the better the better actors you know they take they and they it's they draw from the inside and they it's like the internalized the, their internal becomes the external like like uh dustin hoffman in in the graduate he, he you know it's he was really miscast for 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 that part if you think about it i mean the mo the book was ba the book described him as uh uh blonde haired blue eyed you know athletic right yeah, big tall uh, yeah right and and uh, <laughs> Dustin Hoffman was anything but that, and but he, but he was able to do even though he didn't physically uh, represent that, was that he he is he ex took the ex the the internal what the internal world of that character was and made it external, and that's why we that that was such an iconic character for that movie, uh, and I and so you know Stephen really does that for a case of blue is that he he internally takes the internal and makes it external and that's what makes a, a performance so so vibrant no i to totally agree and uh folks when you have a chance and, and you check out this this movie you're going to just absolutely love it because it's a smart film and what i mean by that is that it's it's not something that's going to be predictable and it's going to be something that drags you and to me anyway took me in a bunch of different emotions and, and took me into a lot of different places. And, and Steven certainly did that with the character of Richard. 
something easily identifiable. So even if you're not of, let's say, a grandfather age or a, or a grandfather, you're going to like this film because of where it takes you. And I think, too, that it does show you some of what older men tend to go through. You know, there's a little bit of we all think to an extent that we're 16 years old and we can still make the varsity baseball team. And, you know, it doesn't matter if we're 52 or 72. Uh, There's a part of us that says, hey, you know, if I spend a week working really hard, I can be just as good at sports as I was when I was 16. And we know that's not true, but there's a part of us that does that. And so there's little parts of Richard, I think, throughout this movie that do some calling back to when he was younger and still thinking that, hey, I could still do this. I could still have this kinds of relationships and I can still uh, stay out to all hours of the night. And uh, it, But then there's also the reality side of where you are, uh, you know, health-wise and age-wise and a little bit of what's appropriate behavior or age-appropriate behavior and where you cross some of those lines and he has a friend that calls him out on a couple of things. Or, or questions him, gives him a, 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 you know, raises an eyebrow as far as you're doing what again? You know? <laughs> well, he tries to escape into his past is what he tries to do. And no. that's a, that's a, it's a tough one to, tough one to do. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. And you know, that's, that's the, the old uh, expression, you can't go home again. Um, and for some of us guys, you can't, you can't, you can try, but you can't always go back to where you were, you know, gener- you know, decades ago. Yeah, it can be a tough pill to swallow, but it's, but I think that, you know, if you're open to it, there's so much vibrancy, you know, all, all around. And that's, that's, you know, part of the hopeful message that I, you know, that I hope people leave when they, when they finish watching the movie is it, it ends on a, on a very hopeful note in that regard. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, but it's a little bit of the, you know, we don't have these coming of age for guys that are already of age, right? You, you have the, the, you know, there's plenty of teen angst movies and there's plenty of, you know, 20 year olds that are trying to hang out with high school kids and there's plenty of these things, but, uh, you know, there really aren't any movies about older guys that are, are going through what, what Richard's going through. Mm. Yeah. It's funny that you should say that because I, the, I, I always did think of it as a coming of age movie for, for, uh, for broom, for boomers. <laughs> oh, abs- absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, one thing I, w- I will tease a little bit is just that you need to pay attention when you watch this movie. There's, there's lots of little things in here and I won't say Easter egg. I think that's a little overused, but there's, there's things where when you pay attention, you're going to be rewarded for paying attention. And, (laughs) and I always love that when, when you can walk out and we were talking a little bit before of when you can watch a movie several times and then you're picking up little details that you missed before. So as you're watching this and you're, and you're stimulated by a great story, also keep, Pay attention to what's going on in the scenes. Absolutely, and it's. Uh, I think that uh, uh, watching it a second time, you, you see it in a completely different way, which is also fun. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I definitely agree with that. And uh, Dana, anything else that you want to talk about as far as a case of blue and and where where can people find the the movie and and get it. Well, the simplest way of finding it is just to come to a case of blue.com. And uh, it's currently on sale as, as, as a DVD or as a Blu-ray. Uh, and uh, that's, that's right now where it's available. Okay. And folks, we'll put links in the show notes uh, for this as well. And do yourself a favor, you know, when you're binge watching so much, so many other things, Get yourself a smart movie that you're really going to enjoy and order yourself a, a case of blue because you, you'll you be rewarded and you'll be playing this movie multiple times. Now, Dana, any, where can people get in contact with you, follow you, you know, see what you have going on? 
Oh, sure. Well, there's a, there's a, a case of blue, uh, has a, a Facebook page, uh, which I, I share about uh, things that are going on with the film. Uh, and uh, you can certainly join the mailing list at thecaseofblue.com, but the, the Facebook page, uh, you can, you can find the link on that page as well. Uh, it's, uh, for whatever reason, they wouldn't permit me <laughs> to have a case of blue for, for the Facebook URL, but I think, I believe it's facebook.com slash ACOB feature film, uh, which, which I can, you can put in the notes as well, yeah. if that's helpful. Uh, and there's also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my production company is, is, uh, in, you know, in honor of my grandfather, Dane Gramp Productions, that's D-A-N-E-G-R-A-M-P.com. And that has uh, some of the other films that I've done as well. Okay, fantastic. And we'll be being sure to put all these links um, into the show notes so it makes it nice and easy for folks to just click on those things and, and get to right where the information is. As we wrap up, any last memories, anything that you would uh, want to share about your grandfather and any advice? I guess it's two parts. Anything that you want to share about your grandfather and then any advice that you have for old guys like myself with grandkids about being a, a, a grandpa? Oh, man, I don't think I'm going to give you any advice about being a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's really my place. I'm just trying to get through fatherhood at the moment. <laughs> uh, totally understand. I, I there think that, you know, I think that uh, they can be really exhausting, uh, you know, but there, there's nothing, uh, you know, nothing more rewarding than spending time with your kids or your grandkids. Uh, I don't think I need to tell people that, though. I mean, I think, I think that that's if you if you. If you've gotten bit by the bug in that regard, you know what you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Uh, in terms of my grandfather, if you uh, a story to end with, I this is a story that I I told at his funeral service, and I'll never forget this. So my car was, I think I must have been a, uh, 21, and my car was giving me trouble. I I think that there was some water in the gasoline tank and my grandfather just kept telling me you know put some dry gas in and so i was like all right but it's not working and so <laughs> so i so i uh i went and brought it to uh the dealership that does service for the car for them to look at it and uh and they did and they told me it was going to cost like eight hundred dollars to fix this and my grandfather got really mad at me he's like you haven't used the dry gas enough <laughs> <laughs> don't you dare pay them eight hundred dollars <laughs> like i had this money right you know and 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 my father was like very happy and willing to was like well you know if it's that's what's gonna cut like, he was very generous in this and very helpful i had a wonderful i have a wonderful father very supportive so but my grandfather was insistent and he said, he said, you tell them, no, thank you. And you're going to come back. And I'm like, okay. So uh, I called them up, I called up the place and they, and they're like, and I said, I'm, I'm not going to take the service. I'm just going to come and get the car. And so, and so they're like, well, it's going to cost uh, $30 for us to have looked at the car. And so I'm like, oh, all right. And I get off the phone. My grandfather's like, you're not going to be paying them $30 because they looked at your car. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, all right. And he's like, I'm going to drive you over there. So he, so my grandfather like pulls up in front of the, this car service place. And, and I get out of the car and he goes, you go tell them you're not going to be paying for it. You know, the $30 for them to just have looked at your car. And so I walk in, I'll never forget this. I walk in and I go to the, 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 the uh, front cashier guy and, I, and I'm like, I'm here to pick up my car. And the guy rings up, he's like, oh, it'll be $30. And I said, you know, you just looked at my car. I don't understand why, you know, you shouldn't be paying me $30 and, you know, I shouldn't have to pay you $30. And he's like, well, that's just how it is, blah, 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 blah. And I'm sorry, that's just how it is. And I'm about, <laughs> I'm about to totally cave. And I turn and there's my grandfather. Oh. And he's like right behind me with his arms crossed. 
And my grandfather looks at this guy and he just says, I just don't understand. And my and the guy goes immediately goes dip, 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 with the cashiers and they go, okay, <laughs> your car's gonna be picked up. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was really something. I was like, you know, and that that time, so I was 21. My grandfather uh, was 86. You know, and it was like, wow, my grandfather still has it, right? Still right. like, you know, yeah. My grandfather was like this big, burly guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was always like a big, you know, a lot of hair on his arms and hair on his. He was like big, and so he was. It was like, wow, he's still like, awesome. So that it was, it was special, and you know, and. and so there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about my grandparents and 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 my father's father as well. Uh, and he was we didn't really go talk about him, but he certainly had uh, an impact on me, certainly as well. And, you know, and, and I think that the most important thing that we can say about fatherhood and grandfatherhood uh, is that it's really about a transmission of values. And and so the presence of these people in our lives and how they operate and how we see how they operate is really important to uh, to how we you know we operate ourselves and without that without without those figures in our lives uh it's really problematic and i and i was extremely blessed to to have a wonderful father and wonderful grandfathers and you know and i and i'm I, 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 I'm a much better person as a result. And so, yeah. No, that, that's awesome. Dana, thank you again so much for being on the cool grandpa podcast. I, I sure do appreciate it. And folks, let's, let's go out there and let's check out, uh, the black hole producers and, uh, let's check out the no pizza, no, no cake book and everything that else that, that Dana has going on. Because I will tell you, you will be rewarded for ordering a case of blue for sure. So thanks, thanks again, Dana, for being on. Thank you so much. It's really been a pleasure. What a fun conversation with Dana. I'm so glad that you were able to join that conversation. I really enjoyed listening to how his grandfathers helped nurture that creativity side and helped Dana learn to kind of stand up for himself at the car dealership. I love that story at the end of our conversation. The part I also enjoyed was talking about how we can encourage our grandchildren and our children with using technology to do things like write a book, create their own YouTube channel, maybe a blog, whatever it is that can help nurture that creative side of us. It was great talking about A Case of Blue. It was definitely hard to talk about the movie without giving too much away. You guys will be richly rewarded if you buy the DVD or the Blu-ray disc. You will need to watch it a couple of times to catch everything that's going on in that movie. But when you do, you will be richly rewarded for having watched such a smart and interesting film. What I want you guys to do is make sure that you subscribe to the podcast and that you share it with a friend. And until next time, remember to be cool. Thank you for listening to the Cool Grandpa Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me a favor and share it with a friend. That's the best way you can help us to expand our community, as well as get the news out about how valuable grandpas are in the lives of those kids. If you'd like to leave me a comment or shoot me a potential topic for this uh, podcast, please go to www.cool-grandpa.us. Look for the comments tab, fill it out, hit submit, it's as easy as that. Until next time, remember to stay cool.